Welcome again to the VFG. Um, we are nearing the uh, last quarter of the story, so let's get into the exciting part. Yesterday, if you remember, um, they were standing in the queen's backyard in the garden. They had made it all the way to her house, um, which was hard because there's guards, and you can imagine if you try to get into the White House where the president is, that would be a pretty tricky thing to do. They're important people and they want to keep them safe. Then they had to go around and look in each of the windows to figure out which window was the queen's window. So they looked around and finally they found it and the BFG gently put Sophie on the windowsill and then the um, queen definitely had a travel humper dream because they um, heard her howling and yowling and oh no and da -da 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 -da. and then when she woke up she was telling her maid everything that she'd heard and the maid said oh my gosh that was just in the papers this morning let me show you hi Dexter hi Dexie and so um, she started to say that is really peculiar that I dreamed exactly what was in the papers and then she looked and Sophie that she had also dreamed was sitting on her windowsill so now the queen's trying to decide, am I going crazy or is this really a true thing? So that is where we're gonna take off. I'm gonna back up just a little bit to yesterday so we can kind of remember where we were and um, when we go back. I think you have dreamed that part too, your majesty, Sophie said calmly. That pulled the queen up short. It took the smile right off her face. She certainly had dreamed that part of it. She was remembering now how at the end of her dream, it had said that there was a little girl and a big friendly giant and they would come to show her how to find the nine horrible man-eating giants. But be careful, the queen told herself, keep very calm because this is surely not very far from the place where madness begins. You did dream that, didn't you, your majesty? The maid was out of it now. She just stood there goggling. Yes, murmured the queen. Yes, now that you come to mention it, I did. But how could you know that I dreamed it? Oh, that's a long story, your majesty, Sophie said. Would you like me to call the big friendly giant? The queen looked at the child. The child looked straight back at the queen, her face open and quite serious. The queen simply didn't know what to make of it. Was somebody pulling her leg, she wondered. Shall I call him for you, Sophie went on. You'll like him very much. The queen took a deep breath. She was glad no one except her faithful old Mary was there to see what was going on. Very well, she said, you may call your giant. No, wait a moment, Mary, pull yourself together. Give me my dressing gown and slippers. The maid did as she was told. The queen got out of bed and put on a pale pink dressing gown, which is like a bathrobe and slippers. You may call him now, the queen said. Sophie turned her head toward the garden and called out, BFG, Her Majesty the Queen um, would have, was going to like to see him. The Queen crossed over to the window and stood beside Sophie. Come down off that ledge, she said. You're going to fall backwards any moment. Sophie jumped down into the room and stood beside the Queen at the open window. Mary, the maid, stood behind him. Her hands were now planted firmly on her hips, and there was a look on her face which seemed to say, I want no part of this fiasco. I don't see any giants, the queen said. Please wait, Sophie said. Shall I take her away now, ma'am, the maid said. Take her downstairs and get her some breakfast, said the queen. Just then, there was a rustle in the bushes beside the lake, and out he came, 24 feet tall, wearing his black cloak with the grace of a nobleman, still carrying his long trumpet in one hand, he strode magnificently across the palace lawn toward the window. The maid screamed, and can you imagine? You're going, yeah, right, there's gonna be a giant coming out of the trees, and then you go, oh my gosh, you just would hardly be able to believe it. He was still carrying his long trumpet in one hand, and he strode magnificently across the palace lawn toward the window. The maid screamed. The queen gasped. Sophie waved. The BFG took his time. He was very dignified in his approach, and when he was close to the window, where the three of them were standing, he stopped and made a low, graceful bow. His head, after he straightened it up again, was almost exactly level with the watchers at the window. Your Magister, he said, 
I use your humbug servant. And he bowed again. Considering she was meeting a giant for the first time in her life, the queen remained astonishingly self-composed. Well, we are very pleased to meet you, she said. Down below, a gardener was coming across the lawn with a wheelbarrow. He caught sight of the BFG's legs over to his left. His gaze traveled slowly upward along the height of his enormous body. He gripped the handles of the wheelbarrow. He swayed, he tottered, and then he keeled over in the grass in a dead faint. Nobody even noticed him. Oh, Magister, cried the BFG. Oh, Queen, oh, Monarcher, oh, Golden Sovereign, oh, Ruler of Straight Lines, oh, Sultana. I has come here with my little friend Sophie to give you... The BFG hesitated, searching for the right word. To give me what, said the Queen. Assistance, the BFG said, beaming. The Queen looked puzzled. He sometimes speaks a little funny, Your Majesty, Sophie said. He never went to school. Well, then we must send him to school, the Queen said. We have some very good schools in our country. I has great secrets to tell your Magister, the BFG said. Oh, I should be delighted to hear them, the Queen said, but not my dressing gown. Shall you wish to get dressed, ma'am, the maid said. Have either of you had breakfast, the Queen asked. Oh, could we, cried Sophie. Oh, please, I haven't eaten a thing since yesterday. So how long, how much time has passed in this whole part of the book? From just her saying that, I haven't eaten a thing since yesterday. Only one day has passed for this whole book, if you can even believe it. I was about to have mine, the queen said, but Mary dropped it. The maid gulped. I imagine we have more food here in the palace, the queen said, speaking to the BFG. Perhaps you and your little friend would care to join me. Will it be repulsant snozcumbers, Magister? The BFG asked. Will it be what? said the queen. Stinky snozcumbers, the BFG said. What is he talking about? said the queen. It sounds like a rude word to me. She turned to the maid and said, Mary, ask them to serve breakfast for three in the... Hmm, I think I better be in the ballroom. That has the highest ceiling. To the BFG, she said, I'm afraid you'll have to go through the door on your hands and knees, but I shall send someone to show you the way. The BFG reached up and lifted Sophie out of the window. You and I is leaving her magister alone to get dressed, he said. No, leave the little girl here with me, the queen said. We'll have to find her something to put on. She cannot eat breakfast in her nightie. The BFG returned Sophie to the bedroom. Can we have sausage, your majesty, Sophie asked and bacon, and fried eggs. Oh, I think that could be managed, the queen said, smiling. Oh, just wait till you taste it, she said to the BFG. No more snozcumbers from me, for you from now on. This is called the Royal Breakfast. There was a frantic scurry among the palace servants when orders were received from the queen that tw a 24 foot giant must be seated with her majesty in the great ballroom within the next half hour. The butler, an imposing personage named Mr. Tibbs, was in supreme command of all the palace servants, and he did the best he could in such short time available. A man does not rise to become the queen's butler unless he is gifted with extraordinary ingenuity, adaptability, versatility, dexterity, cunning, sophistication, and sagacity. Discretion and a host of other talents that neither you or I possess, Mr. Tibbs had them all. He was in the butler's pantry, sipping an early morning glass of light ale when the order reached him. In a split second, he made the following calculations in his head. If a normal six-foot man requires a three-foot high table to eat off of, then a 24-foot giant will require a 12-foot high table to eat at. And if a six-foot man requires a chair with two-foot high seats, a 24-foot giant will require a chair with an eight-foot high seat. Everything, Mr. Tibbs told himself, must be multiplied by four. Two breakfast eggs must become eight. Four rashers of bacon must become 16. Three pieces of toast must become 12, and so on and so on. These calculations about the food were immediately passed on to Monsieur Papillion, the royal chef. Mr. Tibbs skimmed into the ballroom. Butlers don't walk, they skim over the ground. 
followed by a whole army of footmen. The footmen all wore knee breeches, and every one of them displayed beautiful rounded calves and ankles. There is no way you can become a royal footman unless you have a well-turned ankle. It's the first thing they look for when you're interviewed. Push the grand piano into the center of the room, Mr. Tibbs whispered. Butlers never raised their voice above a whisper. The four footmen moved the piano. Now, fetch a large chest of drawers and put it on top of the piano, Mr. Tibbs whispered. Three other footmen fetched a very fine Chippendale mahogany chest of drawers and placed it on top of the piano. That will be his chair, Mr. Tibbs whispered. It's exactly eight feet off the ground. Now, we shall make a table upon which this gentleman may eat his breakfast in comfort. Fetch me four of the tall grandfather clocks. There are plenty of them around the palace. Each clock should be 12 feet high. 16 footmen spread out around the palace to find the clocks. They were not easy to carry and they required four footmen to carry each one. Place the four, four clocks in a rectangle eight. Eight feet by four along the grand piano, Mr. Tibbs whispered. The footman did so. Now, fetch me the young prince's ping pong table, Mr. Tibbs whispered. The ping pong table was carried in. Unscrew the legs and take them away, Mr. Tibbs whispered. This was done. Now, place the ping pong table on top of the four grandfather clocks, Mr. Tibbs whispered. To manage this, the footman had to stand on, stand on step ladders. Mr. Tibbs took a, st stood back to survey the new furniture. None of it is in the classic style, he whispered, but it will have to do. He gave the orders that a damask tablecloth should be draped over the ping pong table. And in the end, it looked quite elegant after all. At this point, Mr. Tibbs seemed to hesitate. The footman all stared at him aghast. Butlers never hesitate, not even when they're faced with the most impossible problems. It's their job to be totally decisive at all times. Hmm, knives and forks and spoons, Mr. Tibb was heard to mutter. Our cutlery will be like little pins in his hand. But Mr. Tibbs did not hesitate for long. Tell the head gardener, he whispered, that I require immediately a brand new unused garden fork and also a spade. And for a knife, we shall use the great sword hanging in the hall in the morning room. But clean the sword well first. It was last used to cut off the head of King Charles the first, and there may still be a little dried blood on the blade. When all of this had been accomplished, Mr. Tibbs stood near the center of the ballroom, casting his expert butler's eye over the scene. Had he forgotten anything? He certainly had. What about a cup of coffee for the large gentleman? Fetch me, he whispered, the biggest jug you can find from the kitchen. A splendid one-gallon porcelain water jug was brought in and placed on the giant's table beside the garden fork and the garden spade and the great sword. So much for the giant. Mr. Tibbs then had the footman move a small, delicate table and two chairs right alongside the giant's table. This was for the queen and for Sophie. The fact that the giant's table and chair towered above the smaller table simply could not be helped. All of these arrangements were only just completed when the queen now fully dressed in a trim skirt and cashmere cardigan, entered the ballroom holding Sophie by the hand. A pretty blue dress that had once belonged to one of the princesses had been found for Sophie. And to make her look prettier still, the queen had picked a superb sapphire brooch from her dressing table and pinned it on the left side of Sophie's chest. The big friendly giant followed behind him, but he had an awful job getting through the door. He had to squeeze himself through on his hands and knees with two footmen pushing him from behind and two pulling him from the front. But he got through in the end. He had removed his black cloak and got rid of his trumpet and was now wearing his ordinary simple clothes. As he walked across the ballroom, he had to stoop quite a lot to avoid hitting the ceiling. And because of this, he failed to notice an enormous chandelier. A shower of glass fell upon the poor BFG Gong hummers and bogwinkles, he cried. What was that? Oh, it was a Louis the Fifteenth, said the queen, looking slightly put out. He's never been in a house before, Sophie said. Mr. Tibbs scowled. He directed the four footmen to clean up the mess, and then with a disdainful little wave of his hand, he indicated to the giant that he should seat himself. What a fizz whizzy flush bungling see, cried the BFG. I is going to be bug as a snug in a rug up there. Does he always speak like that? The queen asked. Quite often, said Sophie. 
he gets tangled up with his words. The BFG sat down in the chest of drawers and gazed in wonder around the ballroom. By gumdrops, he cried, what a spiffling wopsy room he is in. It is so gigantuous, I is needing binoculars and telescopes to see what is going on in the other end. The footman arrived carrying silver trays with fried eggs, bacon, sausage, and fried potatoes. At this point, Mr. Tibbs suddenly realized that in order to serve the BFG on his 12 foot high grandfather clock table, he was gonna to have to climb on top of one of the tall step ladders. What's more, he must do it balancing a huge warm plate on the palm of his hand and holding a gigantic silver coffee pot in the other. A normal man would have flinched at the thought of it, but good butlers never flinch. Up he went, up, 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 while the Queen and Sophie watched him with great interest. It is possible that they were both secretly hoping he would lose his balance and go crashing to the floor, but good butlers never crash. At the top of the ladder, Mr. Tibbs, balancing like an acrobat, poured the BFG's coffee and placed an enormous plate before him. I can't wait to see what he thinks of it because all he's ever had in his whole life are icky snozcumbers. Let's see what he thinks. On the plate were eight eggs, 12 sausages, 16 brashers of bacon, and a heap of fried potatoes. What is this please, your majesty? The BFG asked, peering down at the queen. He's never eaten anything except snozcumbers. Before in his life, Sophie explained, they taste revolting. They don't seem to have stumped his growth, the queen said. The BFG grabbed the garden spade and scooped up all the eggs, all the sausage, the bacon, and the potatoes in one go and shoveled them all into his enormous mouth. Oh, by goggles, he cried. This stuff is making snozcumbers taste like swatch wallop. The queen glanced up, frowning. Mr. Tibbs looked down at his toes and his lips started moving in a silent prayer. That was the only one little titchy bite, the BFG said. Is you having any more of this delunctuous grubble in your cupboard, Magister? Tibbs, said the queen, showing the true regal hospitality, fetch the gentleman another dozen fried eggs and sausages. Mr. Tibbs swam out of the room, muttering unspeakable words, and he wiped his brow with the white handkerchief. The BFG lifted the huge jug and took a swallow. Ouch, he cried, blowing a mouthful across the ballroom. Please, this is horrible swig pill I is drinking, Magister. It's coffee, the queen told him, and it's freshly roasted. It is filthsome, the BFG cried out. Where is the frogscottle? The what, said the, said the queen. Delumptuously busy frogscottle, the BFG answered. Everyone must be drinking frogscottle with breakfast, Magister and then we can all be whiz-popping ha happily afterwards. Now, do you think that's something the queen is gonna wanna know about or drink? I don't think so, you would never say that to the queen. What does he mean, said the queen, frowning at Sophie. What is whiz-popping? Sophie kept a very straight face. BFG, she said, there is no frog scottle here and whiz-popping is strictly forbidden. What, cried the BFG. No frobscottle, no whiz popping, no glumptuous music, no boom, boom, boom. Absolutely not, Sophie told him firmly. Oh, if he wants to sing, please let him sing, the queen said. He doesn't want to sing, Sophie said. Well, he said he wants to make music, the queen said, went on. Shall I send for the violins? No, your majesty, Sophie said. He was only joking. A shy little smile crossed the BFG's face. Listen, he said, peering down at Sophie. If they isn't having any frog scuttle here in the palace, I can still go whiz popping perfectly without it if I is trying hard enough. No, cried Sophie, don't. You're not going to, I'm begging you. Oh, music is very good for the digestion, Queen said. When I'm up in Scotland, they play the bagpipes outside the window while I'm eating. Do play something for us, the B BFG. I has her majesty's permission, the BFG said. And all at once, he let fly with a whiz popper that sounded like a bomb had exploded in the room. The queen jumped, I bet she did. Whoopee, shouted the BFG. This is better than bagel pipes, is it not, Magister? 
It took the queen a few seconds to get over the shock. Um, I quite prefer the bagpipes, she said, but she couldn't stop smiling to herself. During the next 20 minutes, a whole relay of footmen were kept busy carrying to and fro from the kitchen, whoops, second and third and fourth helpings and fifth helpings of fried eggs and sausage for the ravenous delighted BFG. When the BFG had consumed his 72nd fried egg, Mr. Tibbs sidled up to the queen. He bent low from the waist and whispered in her ear, Chef sends his apologies, your majesty. He says he has no more eggs in the kitchen. What's wrong with the hens? The queen asked. Uh, nothing's wrong with the hens, your majesty, Mr. Tibbs whispered. Then tell them to lay some more, the queen said. She looked at the BFG. Have some toast and marmalade while you're waiting, she said. The toast is finished, Mr. Tibbs whispered, and the chef said there is no more bread. Tell him to bake some more, said the queen. When all of this was going on, Sophie had been telling the queen everything, absolutely everything about her visit to giant country. The queen listened, appalled. When Sophie had finished, the queen looked up at the BFG who was sitting high above her. He was now eating sponge cake. A big friendly giant, she said. Last night, those man-eating brutes came to England. Can you remember where they were the night before? The BFG put a whole round sponge cake into his mouth and chewed it slowly while he thought about this question. Your Majesty, he said, I do not think I is remembering where they is going the night before. He was galloping off to Sweden to taste something sour. Fetch me the telephone, the Queen commanded. Mr. Tibbs placed the instrument on the table. The Queen lifted the receiver. Get me the Queen King of Sweden, she said. Oh, good morning, said the Queen. Is, is everything all right in Sweden? Everything is terrible, the Queen of Sweden answered. There is panic in the capital. Two nights ago, 26 of my loyal subjects disappeared. My whole country is in a panic. Your 26 loyal subjects were all eaten by giants, the Queen said. Apparently, they like the taste of Swedes. Why do they like the taste of Swedes, the King asked. Because the Swedes of Sweden is having a sweet and sour taste, said the BFG. I don't know what you're talking about, the Queen said, growing testy. It's hardly a joking matter when one's loyal subjects are being eaten like popcorn. They've eaten mine as well, said the Queen. Who is they, for heaven's sakes, the King asked. Giants, said the Queen. Look here, the King said, are you feeling all right? Oh, it's been a rough morning, the Queen said. First I had a horrid nightmare, then the maid dropped my breakfast, and now I've got a giant piano, a giant sitting on my piano. You need a doctor, quick, the King said. Oh, I'll be all right, said the Queen. I must go now. Thanks for your help, and she replaced the receiver. Your BFG is right, the Queen said to Sophie. Those nine manning brutes did go to Sweden. It's horrible, Sophie said. Please stop them. You have to, Your Majesty. I'd like to make one more check call before I call out the troops, the Queen said. Once more, she looked up at the BFG. He was eating donuts now, popping them into his mouth nine or ten at a time like peas. Think hard, BFG, she said. Where did those horrid giants say they were going three nights ago? The BFG thought long and hard. Ho, ho, he cried at last. I is remembering. Where, said the BFG. One was off to Baghdad, the BFG said. As they is galloping past my cave, Flesh Lump Eater is waving his arms and shouting at me. I is off to Baghdad, and I was going to Baghdad and Mum and every one of their ten children as well. Once more, the Queen lifted the receiver. Get me the Lord Mayor of Baghdad, she said. If they don't have a Lord Mayor, get me the next best thing. In five seconds, a voice was on the line. Here is the Sultan of Baghdad speaking, the voice said. Listen, Sultan, the Queen said. Did anything unpleasant happen in your city three nights ago? Every night unpleasant things are happening in Baghdad, the Sultan said. We are chopping off people's heads like we're chopping parsley. Oh, I've never chopped parsley in my life, the Queen said. I want to know if anyone has disappeared recently from Baghdad. Only my uncle, Kelfin Haran al-Rashid, the sultan said. He disappeared from his bed three nights ago, together with his wife and his ten children. There you is, said the BFG, whose wonderful ears enabled him to hear what the sultan was saying to the queen. 
Flesh Lump Eater did that one. He went off to Baghdad, to Baghdad, and Mum, and all the little kitties. The queen replaced the receiver. That proves it, she said, looking up at the BFG. Your story is apparently quite true. Summon the head of the army and the head of the Air Force immediately. So that is the end of that. The next chapter is called The Plan. So looks like they're going to have to come up with a plan to get these giants and to stop them from eating people and children and what a terrible, terrible thing. But now they have the queen on board and now she called the army and the Air Force to help. So we'll see tomorrow what they come up with for a plan. Um, and it should be exciting. Can't wait to hear. We only have just a little bit left and then our book is done. So I hope you had a great day. I hope you're enjoying the story. Um, and I hate to hold you on a cliffhanger, but we'll find out tomorrow what happens. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a great day. Bye, you guys.